Hello, everybody. My name is Professor Osnat Walfish, and I'm the head of the Helen Snyder Women's Hospital here at Rabin Medical Center in Israel. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present our work and our project, a project which was born from a combination of a few factors. First of all, the Klalit Health Medical Insurance, which is the largest medical insurance in Israel. Secondly, Rabin Medical Center, which is where I work. And thirdly, Palsen Moore Company, which developed the device which I will be talking about. So, the future is already here. Telemedicine already has many faces for remote, online, mobile, and real-time clinical care solutions. Here are just two examples from our day-to-day -day lives. On the left side, you see the routine, well-known, simple phone video medical consultation. We have that all the time. On the right side, you see a more high-tech solution, the Taito, which is a well-established service here at Klalit Health Medical Insurance, and it allows a self-made physical examination performed at home by the patient, inspection, auscultation, thermometer, and all of this is being shared online, real time with a remote physician. But let's go back to what we are doing. I want to take you through the three principal sections. First of all, let's get to know the device itself. Secondly, I want to show you the pilot study that we did for proof of concept. And thirdly, how the service is actually operated. So, this is the device. Look at it. It's a handheld portable ultrasound transducer manufactured by Pulse and More, which is an Israeli based high tech company. It's attached to everyone's smartphone, doesn't matter which company of its smartphone. It's operated through a designated application downloaded to the phone, and it allows remote fetal sonographic assessment by the patient. This can be operated by two models. The first one, which is the one that we actually use in day to day, is the app guided mode. It's a cell scan asynchronous performed by the woman itself. So the doctor is not online with her at the same time. The patient is performing a series of predetermined steps uploaded to a secure cloud for remote offline expert review. So the first mode is app guided mode. The second mode is a clinician guided mode which is a real-time ultrasound where the physician guides the patient on how, where, and when to scan, simultaneously talking to the patient while seeing her and seeing the scan live. So that's the second mode. So app mode or clinician guided mode. So with this powerful tool at hand, we first set a pilot study to see if this works, mainly to obtain proof of concept that women actually can scan themselves without the physician present in the room with her and performing the examination. So women can scan themselves was the proof of concept was set out to perform. And as you can see here, this was published in telemedicine and e-health in 2022 by our team. Now, I want to take you through the pilot study itself. So this was an observational, non-interventional trial with 100 pregnant women at weeks between 14 and 40 weeks of gestation. Each participant was requested to scan at their own judgment at least once a day and up to three times a day for seven to 10 days, that was it. One to three times a day for seven to 10 days. Each scan lasts three minutes and is composed of six predetermined segments of scanning with a pre-scan animated video tutorial before each segment. So it can be easy for the patient to understand 
what she's supposed to do and how she's supposed to scan. Now, these six segments of each scan, we were basing that on a previously published and adopted six-step standardized approach, which you can see the publication right here from 2014. So we based our six-step scan to this paper. These are the six basic steps. Step one, these were all aimed to ensure that all essential fetal parameters can be visualized. Now, the first one on the left side on the top is fetal presentation and lie. Second, fetal cardiac activity. Third, number of fetuses. Four, placenta location and position. Five, estimation of amniotic fluid volume. And six is biometry. Now I have to say that this was not included in our pilot study and was replaced with the free scan without predetermined steps. So the part of the biometry was not completed. Accordingly, before each segment, an animated video tutorial that you can see here, you see how the patient can see the tutorial and understand what she's supposed to do in each step. And this was coupled with verbal guidance. Step one usually takes 15 seconds, steps two to five about 30, 40 seconds, and step six, as I said, was a free scan for the remainder of the time. Now you can see that the patient is moving the phone and the um, transducer in a way that she can see herself what she's scanning. And this was done according to this tutorial that you see right here. So, as I said, 100 women completed the trial. Uh, we had about, they were, you can see, about 32 years old. Mean gestational age was 23, 24 weeks. They completed about 13 to 14 scans per each participant, which with an average of between one to two scans per day, short scans per day. Each of the scans, as I said, includes all of the five steps that I talked about. In total, at the end of this pilot study, we had 1,360 scans in total that we were able to analyze. And when we analyzed them, each scan was reviewed independently by two sonographers or physicians. So each of the scans reviewed independently by two healthcare providers. These are pictures of some of the first scans included in this pilot study that I was talking about. Now let's take a look at the results of the pilot study. Look at this, we were able to detect fetal heart rate in over 95% of cases. We were able to um, see amniotic fluid volume, you see it on the fourth row from the top, in about 92%, and fetal bo body movements in 88% of the scans. We detected with lesser success fetal tone and breathing movements. So we were very happy with the results. First time that you can prove that a woman can self-perform an ultrasound at home and we can still see the fetal heart activity, body movements, amniotic fluid, etc. So with these results in mind, having established the proof of concept that women can scan themselves, Clalit HMO launched its large-scale service using the app guided mode. So women's, women were watching this tutorials and performing home ultrasounds. Let me walk you through how this worked. So the service is available for every insured pregnant woman in Clalit over 14 weeks of gestation that has a smartphone, any kind of smartphone. The woman needs, needs to sign an informed consent. And then she buys the device, which is at a very affordable price, and a courier delivers the gel and the device to her home, wherever she lives. Then she installs the Clalit and Pulse and More application on her smartphone. And she can start doing the self scans with remote expert review. This is an offline expert review, not online expert review. So she sends it to the cloud, 
and the healthcare provider watches and sends her back the feedback. So this is how it worked. The rules of engagement work. First of all, you can do up to three scans a day. Israeli patients can go crazy and do even 10 scans a day. So we limited it to three scans a day. You can do up to 50 scans during the entire pregnancy. Uh, we are available to provide the interpretation and the feedback seven days a week, 365 days a year from 8 a.m. to 10 at night uh, throughout the year. Every scan is uploaded by the application and reviewed for three parameters, as I said before, fetal heartbeat, fetal movements, and amniotic fluid volume. The three parameters that the detectability rate was shown to be higher than 90% in the pilot study that I was talking about before. So what you see here is actually the dashboard that displays to the provider, to the interpreter, all the scans for the on-call sonographers to review. So the people who are at this side, who are providing the service, are either OB-GYN experts or so, um, um, sonography experts that have an, um, an expertise in obstetrics specifically. This is how the dashboard looks. And this is a real life example of an actual scan performed by a 27 weeker at home on her sofa in the evening. Uh, this, this specific one was done on October, 2022. So you can see how the dashboard displays to the interpreter, to the doctor, all the five steps that I was talking about. And you can easily see the placenta location, amniotic fluid volume, and fetal movements, and fetal heartbeat. So this is how it looks. And then each scan is reviewed, as I said, for three parameters, the fetal heartbeat, the fetal movements, and the amniotic fluid volume. Each parameter, the doctor can say either it's normal or abnormal or inadequate, which means it's technically inadequate. These are the three options that the doctor can choose while re reviewing the scans. If all three parameters are normal, patients receive a reassuring SMS. If one parameter is abnormal or inadequate, the patient is contacted by phone for further evaluation by the doctor. Now, the doctor can tell her either to rescan or the doctor can refer her for real life ultrasound at the hospital or at the clinic. So let me take you through how we performed since March of 2021. So that's exactly three years now. First of all, take a look. We had over a hundred thousand scans. Here it says 94,000, but we're already over 100,000. We have over 10,000 users that have used the service since we launched it. Currently, 2,000 are active. So at each given point, we have about 2,000 active participants, but the amount is getting larger and larger. So now we're at 10,000 past or present users. Now, as you can see, after a video is performed, over 90%, 95% of cases are classified as normal, and about 2.8 to 3% are classified as abnormal. Now, what does it mean abnormal? Abnormal means either the amniotic fluid level is abnormal, the heartbeat is not observed, or movements were not observed. If this happens, then, as I said to you before, the patient gets a phone call from the doctor. And then the doctor tells her, either you have to rescan or you have to be referred to the hospital for an in-person scan. But I think the most important take-home message from this slide is that over 95% of cases were cases that were classified as normal in all three parameters that I was talking about. Now, we have numerous, this is Hebrew, I know you don't read Hebrew, but I'm just going to tell you that we have numerous testimonials written uh, for us online or by phone 
that this service provides reassurance, peace of mind, bonding with the baby, less anxiety. So that's a definite thing that we earned using this service. Also, it saves unscheduled visits. Let's say in the evening the patient doesn't feel the baby moving. Instead of running to the hospital or the clinic, she can open the device, turn it on, and just scan her baby. Within an hour or two, the doctor sees it and sends her a reassuring SMS, and then she doesn't have to go to the hospital. So for sure, it saves unscheduled visits. And we also think that specifically high-risk pregnancies may even benefit more than others. For example, many women who are using this device uh, have experienced, unfortunately, in the past adverse pregnancy outcome or repeated pregnancy loss. Their anxiety levels are high. They want to see the doctor very often. They want to see the baby very often. So using this service, we can lower anxiety, anxiety, and we can save unscheduled visits, specifically and even more so to high-risk pregnancies. Now, I've been to the States about a month ago, I think it was, on the SMFM in Washington, and we have presented, I think, five posters related specifically to this service. Let me just share two of them with you. This one shows how the prenatal mobile self-operated home ultrasound service impacts on healthcare resource utilization. And as you can see, we're showing here proxies and hints of how the use of this ultrasound service can save not only anxiety and unscheduled visits, but also money, money to the system and money to the patient. So that's one poster. The second poster talks about the birth outcomes, the impact of birth outcome. We set out to show that it doesn't harm anyone. So not only does it not harm the baby or the mother, but also there are hints that the birth outcomes were slightly better in the study group as compared to the control group. And this, uh, these two posters are done on 5,000 patients. So half of the cohort that we have now which is 10,000. Okay, so within the near future, we plan to gradually shift to an online mode. Remember that I told you that there is an app mode and an online real life mode. Here you can see our handsome Professor Meisner in an online mode with a patient to perform a full remote visit where the doctor talks to the patient, uh, and also she performs the scan, he interprets it, it online, and it can do the full sonographical biophysical profile without him leaving his office and the patient living, leaving her house. Um, you know that Israel is a small country. We think we're big, but we're actually small. But definitely in, pace, in places like Japan, like the United States, like... I guess almost most of the countries, most of the Western countries in the world are larger than Israel. So definitely patients can benefit a lot from staying at home and seeing their doctor and performing the ultrasound without leaving their home as compared to having to drive to the clinic, find a parking space, wait for the schedule call, and then talk to the doctor. So you can see how geography here also makes a difference. Um, so the future studies that we're actually currently working on are trimester specific parameters and guidance. You know, I showed you that we use the generic uh, steps, but each trimester has a specific parameters and we have to build guidance and adapt each trimester to the right uh, movements that the woman should be performing. Also, we are doing a user versus non-user. So those who are using the service versus those who are not using the service. And we're looking at all kinds of maternal outcome, obstetrical outcome, psychological outcome, and economical outcome, like the ones that I've showed you that we presented at the SMFM last month. And we are moving forward. We're also interested in combining this tool together with a remote fetal heart rate monitor, so we can do a full biophysical profile when the woman is at home, including the monitor and the biophysical sonographic uh, profile. And 
we are checking how we can better estimate the amniotic fluid uh, volume. So just imagine, I mean, if we will be able to do all these things, the biometry, the monitor, the full um, biophysical profile, the exact amniotic fluid volume, then women won't actually need to come anymore to the high-risk clinics that we have here because everything will be done remotely and online. So that's a dream which is soon going to come true. I'm sure of it. Okay, let me uh, conclude. So in conclusion, the home ultrasound is a novel teleultrasound solution which reliably allows pregnant women to self perform a fetal ultrasound of sufficient high quality for remote interpretation, either offline or online. Potentially, it not only may reduce maternal anxiety, but also provide clinical reassurance and enable the total antenatal care to be performed remotely. I want to thank you for your kind attention, and we are now open for questions. Thank you. A very wonderful and uh, comprehensive lecture on your home ultrasound system. And all participants of this JSWOG meeting here in Japan could understand how the online ultrasound device works in Israel. And it is surprising that you know so many of Israel pregnant women uh, can utilize this device uh, effectively. Uh, with saving time for waiting at the hospitals and clinics and reducing their anxiety and even more the systematic approach using devices saves babies' lives. So first of all, I'd like to ask you about the legal risks. You mentioned that the proper guidance and video tutorials read the patient to use devices properly. And however, sometimes, you know, the interpretation of images may be difficult because of the patient's obesity or myoma or uh, thick uterine wall or stuff like that, right? So suppose a patient sent images online and doctor reviews the images and if some misinterpretation occurs and baby became at risk uh, later on, so doctor might be sued by the patient. Do you have any experience that, like that? So thank you for the great question, Professor Poe. When we started out, we were a little bit worried about this because we weren't sure about the safety. Mm -hmm. So what we decided was that in any case of even a small um, doubt or if the image was not perfect and whoever was interpreting it was not sure exactly that the amount of fluid is okay, placenta, heart rate movement, etc. They would call the patient and tell them either to repeat the scan using mm -hmm. guidance or to mm -hmm. come into the clinic. So we mm -hmm. took no chances, no mm -hmm. chances whatsoever. And you've seen all that we've seen, the thousands and thousands of women that we've checked. We had absolutely no legal issues because oh. we were very careful to begin with. And mm -hmm. whenever there was a doubt, there was no doubt. We repeated the scan, either on the remotely or face-to-face. -face. Also, mm -hmm. I must say that we use this system only for fetal well-being, mm -hmm. not for anatomical scans as of yet. Uh -huh. So the full anatomical scans, the nu in Israel we do nuchal translucency, first or early anatomical scan, and late anatomical scan. So mm -hmm. the three most important scans, these mm -hmm. are done face-to-face -face and not using the remote device as of now. Maybe I, in the future, mm -hmm. we will start using that for those purposes too. Mm -hmm. uh, there is still a long way to go. And I think that the legal issues may arise when we take it one step forward. But for uh -huh. fetal well-being and mm -hmm. us being so careful, there was mm -hmm. absolutely no legal issue whatsoever. I see, I see. Uh, I am happy to to hear that. Yeah, but um, the in the future, if the the anomaly scans 
uh, can be done by ultrasound. You know, the ultrasound is done by patients, right? So yes. it is a very risky, you know, the, for the medical side. So I think, I think that I I think that uh, if we will take a step forward and do anatomical scans as well remotely, it will not be offline, but it will be online, meaning that the doctor will be with the patient face to face remotely, but face to face guiding her through the scan so that he's sure that he sees everything he wants to see. And if he's not sure, he will call her to come in so that even then, uh, the, the risk of a legal issue, I think, will be very low. But mm-hmm. um, uh, for the offline mode, mm-hmm. um, well, fetal well-being and maybe biometry are the mm-hmm. only things that uh, we will do. Doing and we will do. I see. However, you know, maybe you know, it will be taking a long time you know, that to buy by patient scan, right? You know, it is much easier to, to scan by ourselves, right? So maybe, you know, there is a future issue, but, you know, the, um, I think uh, maybe the anomaly scan can be done by patients, you know, the, with, with doctors, you know, the, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Also, mm-hmm. if I may yeah. add, uh, mm-hmm. sometimes through, with the anatomical scans, we need to do a vaginal uh, scan as well. So with a vaginal transducer. Right. I mean, sometimes if you want to see the head, the head is low, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm mm-hmm. just saying it's still not happening remotely. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. we also have remote vaginal transducers. We use them already, mm-hmm. not for pregnancies, but mm-hmm. for follicular count in IVF. I see. So we are now in the middle of a study mm-hmm. uh, for IVF patients who are mm-hmm. undergoing uh, ovarian stimulation. You know mm-hmm. how they have to do a blood test and a scan every day or two to count the follicles and to see if they're ready for the next step. So mm-hmm. for women, it's horrible to come in every day or every two days. Right. Israel is small, but there is no parking. So mm-hmm. women, <laughs> women hate it. So if we have the transducer for follicular counting for IVF patients, mm-hmm. Potentially, this mm-hmm. can also be an aid for remote anatomical scan if we go mm-hmm. ahead with this step in the future. I see. I see. You know that the, it is reasonable. You know that to to know that you know the IVF patients. You know the it is uh, quite difficult. You know to go and come and uh, to the patient uh, to the the doctors. You know the the follicles are matured or not. You know the, so that is a very good idea. And uh, I I am doing the uh, the fetal CNS scan. You know the bitransvaginal. Way, but you know, the, even for doctors, you know, it is still you know difficult. So you know, yes. the, I'm quite sure. Yes. But you know, for the, for example, you know, RE scan, you know, RE pregnancy scan, you know, the it is uh it is very good, you know, the the for patient, you know, the, to use the transvaginal scan, you know, the uh that is a first step, maybe you know, the in the future. Maybe right? the first step. And I have yeah. to tell you that in Israel, I think we are the one single country in the world Mm -hmm. that provides IVF services for free to Mm -hmm. all the citizens. Mm -hmm. So IVF is flourishing in Israel for two Uh reasons. Mm -hmm. One is that in Israel, having babies is like, uh, it's like, uh, um, it's an optimum. Everybody in Israel wants to have kids. Having kids in Israel is very, very important. I don't know exactly why, but it's very important for everyone. So Uh everyone wants to have kids and Mm -hmm. IVF is for free. So -hmm. you understand that our IVF clinics are working hard. Uh I see. I see. The IVF is very, very, you know, the the flourish in in Japan also. However... The, maybe, you know, the things are very different, you know, the, between Japan and Israel, you know, the Japanese women, you know, the, many of them, they don't want to have the kids and they would like to enjoy their life. <laughs> and uh, so that is a, 
another issue, but you know, the, the there is a difference between the Israel and Japan. But uh, sure. I think you know that. Uh, sorry that I interrupted you. Now yeah. in my IVF uh, clinic here at Bellinson Medical Center, mm -hmm. about 50 percent of mm -hmm. the IVF cycles that we do here mm -hmm. are social, like social fertility preservation, meaning that a mm -hmm. woman comes in when she's 30 years old, 30, 32. She knows mm -hmm. that she doesn't want to have kids yet. So she mm -hmm. undergoes a cycle and preserves the um, the uh, the ovums mm -hmm. and freezes them for mm -hmm. later, and then maybe she will want to become pregnant in fo at 40 years old or something like that. So she has freezed eggs already that mm -hmm. are waiting for her. So about 50% of the cycles are for fertility preservation for social reasons. Mm -hmm. So women want to have their careers and then mm -hmm. the kids. I see. I see. That is a very reasonable way. <laughs> yeah, it's a good solution. Okay, yeah. So going back to the uh, the home ultrasound, and uh, uh, you said that Israel is a very small country, and uh, yes, the same is true as for Japan, right? And uh, But I think you know, there's a, there are usefulness on online ultrasound devices, you know, in the big country like uh, United States or Australia. And because, you know, it takes two hours, three hours from home to hospitals. And uh, it is quite efficient and convenient to uh, communicate with doctors with real images, ultrasound images. And uh, the, maybe, you know, that you know about the situation in the United States and uh, other countries, the big countries, right? Sure. So um, even in Israel, which is a small country, the service is very popular. Mm -hmm. So, and this is short distances. So here you have to drive maximum half an hour to reach your closest hospital. Mm -hmm. So there's so many hospitals in such a small country, yet mm -hmm. the service is very popular. Uh -huh. uh, I can only imagine that in mm -hmm. larger states, larger countries, it, would, it will be much more useful uh -huh. I myself did my fellowship in Toronto, and I remember, and mm -hmm. this is Canada, a very large country in terms of uh, geography, and I remember how women who came into our clinic mm -hmm. at uh, the hospital in Toronto told us mm -hmm. that they traveled for hours and mm -hmm. even came one day before, slept at a hotel just for the appointment at the clinic. Mm -hmm. And many of the appointments at the clinic Mm -hmm. were just for uh, fetal surveillance, fetal growth, you know, monitor, biometry, biophysical profile, and go home. So mm -hmm. imagine the effort of these women coming in every two weeks, every four weeks, and making mm -hmm. this effort when I can do, sh shortly I will be able to do a fetal heart rate monitoring distance mm -hmm. and biophysical profile and biometry, everything when she's sitting at home, wherever she lives, up in the north or down in the south, without needing to actually physically come in. I think it's, it's, it's extremely useful in uh, very large countries, but also very popular in small countries because everybody wants to stay at home. Nobody wants the headache of coming into the clinic. Mm -hmm. Also, I think that women using the service Mm -hmm. are using it sometimes not because they need it as an appointment, but because mm -hmm. they're worried. You know, they were busy today, they didn't feel the baby, they're not sure if everything is okay, they don't want to go to the clinic. So they just, you know, perform the scan whenever they feel like it and they're worried and it reduces anxiety and mm -hmm. saves the need to travel. Yeah, right. I see. So, you know, they even the, the country is a small or big. Maybe, you know, the, during the COVID-19 era, I can easily imagine that, you know, home ultrasound system worked super well, right? And uh, I think most probably the next COVID era will coming. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but uh, if we have such system as uh, home ultrasound beforehand, it will be working very efficiently, right? Definitely. I have to say, uh, the COVID pandemic was a disaster worldwide, but yeah. some good things came out of it, yeah. right? 
the mm -hmm. mRNA vaccine, which was not available before, and mm -hmm. all medical services provided remotely. They right. made us understand mm -hmm. that we don't need to actually see the patient physically for most of the things. And yeah. now the pandemic, thank God, is behind us. But mm -hmm. the use of the services that were developed continues even when there is no pandemic. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I think you know the in my clinic also you know the during the COVID nineteen pandemic, um, the we started to use the, uh, the consultation and counseling online, and yeah. still you know, the, we are using that. And exactly. Very convenient, you know, the, for the patients and also you know the for doctors also, right. And also, you know, the now you know that you you are uh, suffering, you know, very hard time, right? Because of yes. the Hamas war, and the, during this uh, hard era, the women are very safe at home to see doctors and communication with the doctors online, right? So, exactly. uh, yeah. So, so not only pandemic, but also other safety issues. Yeah. Although I have to say that mm -hmm. if you would come to Israel. Professor, mm. and I hope you come soon, mm -hmm. you will see how inside the country of Israel and outside of Gaza Strip, it feels mm. totally normal. We're not mm. afraid to go outside. It uh -huh. feels safe. It looks more horrible on the news than it does actually feel when we're here. But I totally agree. It can be a uh, pandemic. It can be um, safety issues. And it can also be just convenience issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know the I remember that at the beginning of the war, uh, you know the it was so dangerous. You know that I I text my my friends in Israel. You know I have many many friends. You know including you of course. I know. And so you know I texted them. You know the, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you safe? And your family? And then you know the the many of my friends. You know that they are they were so scared and uh, you know. The, if they have the small kids, you know, at home, even right. at home, you know, it was very yeah. dangerous at the time, right? There were so, sirens, there were sirens, yeah. and we had to run to the safe room every time there was a siren. Israel is a small country surrounded mm -hmm. only by enemies. Mm -hmm. We don't have even one neighbor that is yeah. our friend. So mm -hmm. we are, we must stay strong at all times. And yes. War, war times are something of a routine for us, unfortunately. That's mm -hmm. why the military service is mandatory in Israel. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So military service, you know, in Israel. And because of that, you know, the women is so strong, right? <laughs> Much stronger <laughs> than Japanese women. <laughs> I don't know, but I think the women are, women, men, everybody are a little bit more worried than the average. We are uh -huh. always worried. Mm. Okay, so the next question, um, the, I would like to ask the consultant, consultant fee, fee for doctors and using systems, you know, you mentioned about uh, the patient needs to buy the devices, uh, but it is a very affordable price, right? Yes. And uh, so, when, the, yeah, so when the patient send the images online in up mode and uh, get doctor's feedback, how patient pay for that? And uh, how about the online clinician guided mode? Is it uh, more expensive or are they all covered by insurance? So first of all, as I grow older, I understand that the medical insurance issues are very different from country to country. Yeah. Yeah, right. So first I will explain how it works in Israel in general. In mm -hmm. Israel in general, the entire population is insured by law. It's uh -huh. very uh, socialistic system, the okay. health system. That's so everybody good. has an insurance. Mm -hmm. the, m there are four companies mm -hmm. that provide health insurance. Mm -hmm. One that is the largest, that is called Klalit Insurance Company. Yeah. It's maybe the largest insurance company in the world. It covers in Israel the majority of the population, and oh. then there are three smaller um, insurance companies. Mm -hmm. The system is provided by the insurance company, which means the mm -hmm. patient does not need to pay for anything, for any consult, nothing whatsoever. 
just mm -hmm. to buy for an affordable price the device itself. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. in Israel, there are also private health services that mm -hmm. even we provide. So we work in the morning at the hospital, and then mm -hmm. in the evening, we can have a private clinic, which mm -hmm. the patient can come in and pay. And sometimes her insurance will pay her back, sometimes no. Why I'm telling this? Mm -hmm. Because I can see how also private doctors will want to provide this service to their patients, even outside of hospitals. Mm -hmm. For now, it is provided 100% through the insurance of all the women that are insured, that are insured by Clalit. But oh. I can see models where mm -hmm. a private doctor mm -hmm. buys these devices from the company or provides for their patients and mm -hmm. does many of the consultation for the patients remotely. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in private practices, you decide, the doctor decides how much he wants to charge the patient. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's fair to say that if a doctor is doing an online consultation with the patient, Mm -hmm. So he sees her on the screen, he talks to her, he asks her questions, she mm -hmm. does the scan, he interprets the scan at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's just like coming into his clinic. Yeah, right. Yeah. For now, it works only in the public system, totally covered by the insurance. I see. That is very, very good infrastructure, right? The social infrastructure is very, very strong in Israel, so we have to run from the Israel. Right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the last question is, you know, in Japan now, the current uh, the government uh, emphasizes uh, the uh, work style reforming and uh, the reform to address the current situation in which doctors are working too hard uh, for long hours, you know, excessive hours, resulting in doctors becoming exhausted and committing suicide sometimes and wow. quit, quitting their jobs. And so I think, you know, the, how the, the home artisan system actually reduced the doctor's working hours since it was introduced in Israel. So um, I can only speculate mm -hmm. um, because uh, the doctors that are providing the service in my hospital are doing it during their working hours. Mm -hmm. So I can't really say how much time it saves, but I can speculate mm -hmm. that for the doctor's well-being, it can do two things. Mm -hmm. First of all, you know how when you sit in the clinic and the women are crowded outside mm -hmm. and there is uh, who is coming first, who is coming after, I waited two hours, I waited one hour. When it's an online mode, mm -hmm. you reach the patient when it's their time and you provide the service uh, without anyone needing to wait. Even if, I had, uh, even if the patient had an appointment for the online service at around three o'clock, but mm -hmm. the doctor is available only at four o'clock, she mm -hmm. will be at home, whatever, doing what she's doing. And yeah. the doctor is contacting her when the doctor is free. So in terms of having all the uneasiness, physical mm -hmm. uneasiness at work, this is mm -hmm. much easier. Also, I feel that for the doctor's well-being, mm -hmm. online sessions are usually easier. He can sit at the comfort of his office, drinking his coffee, watching mm -hmm. the screen. When mm -hmm. it's the offline mode, he's doing it whenever time he wants. When it's mm -hmm. online mode, it's easier. You see the patient, but you're very comfortable. So I'm not sure it saves time, but mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure it raises the doctor's well-being. I see, I see. But still, you know, the doctors have the physical patients, right? So the both online and offline, the both patients, you know, they have, right? Yes, but it reduces the load of the of the on of the physical patients right. immensely. I mm -hmm. speculate that it can reduce a high risk clinic. Mm -hmm. Let's say I have a high risk clinic here. It's very mm -hmm. busy, five rooms, five doctors, lots of women waiting outside. My mm -hmm. speculation is that the use of the of the um, 
online and offline services can reduce at least 50% of the patients that are coming in, at least. So everything will be more calm. Mm -hmm. I see. I understand. Thank you very much. So, you know, time flies. So, you know, the, we have to conclude this, this session. And uh, Anat, thank you very much again, you know, for joining us online. It the, was my pleasure. And yeah, I invite the, you all to yeah. Israel, to yeah. our beautiful country, when things yeah. will be just a little bit more stable. Mm. I hope uh, more and more of you and your colleagues will come and visit us here. Yeah, and uh, I hope it will all be over soon and uh, there will be the real peace, right? Okay. I hope so. Yeah. Thank you so, so much thank for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you very much again and see you in person again soon.